Okay, okay. Sorry about the technical difficulties. We've, uh, we've consulted and determined it was the hermetic daimones who were infiltrating our sound system. Let me start over. Uh, for those at home, I'm Lucinda Martin. I'm the director of the Rittman Research Institute and the Bibliotheca Philosophica Hermetica, the library of hermetic philosophy. And this evening, we have a round table, which we're calling Hermes Yesterday and Today. Now, as I said before, our library used to be one of the few places to study hermetic discourses and traditions. These things were long viewed as superstitious by academia and by mainstream churches, and thus seen as unworthy of, of attention. In the meantime, scholars have begun to realize the contributions of hermetic streams of thought to the cultural history of humanity. And last November, our library was added to the UNESCO Memory of the World Register because of the contributions some of our authors have made to the development of modern human rights. In 2017, the Rittman family established a museum, the Embassy of the Free Mind, which is where we are this evening, to teach the general public about the content of the library. We present exhibitions, and we offer lectures and seminars, and even a children's program. You might therefore say that the kind of event that we're hosting tonight is in our DNA. It brings together two of the most prominent voices about hermetic traditions and discourses, one operating in academia, and one specialized in communicating to the public. And those are also our two concerns. Wouter J. Hanegraaf is professor of the history of hermetic philosophy and related streams of thought at the University of Amsterdam. He has many scholarly publications, including his most recent book, Hermetic Spirituality and the Historic Imagination. Justin Sledge is the creator of the YouTube channel Esoterica, which has more than 300,000 followers. This evening, we want to explore the past, present, and future of hermetic streams of thought and their study, what role they've played in history, what they mean to people today, and what questions are open that still need to be answered about this subject. Each of our speakers will give a short presentation and then we want to open the discussion to as many questions as possible, both from our live and our remote audience. In this way, we hope to include the perspectives of academics, practitioners, and anyone interested in this fascinating subject. With that, please join me in welcoming Vauta and Justin. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction, uh, first of all, and it's very nice to be here again in the Ritman Library, a place where uh, I've been coming uh, since uh, the end of the 80s, the 1980s, and um, which is really the place uh, where you can study the hermetic literature. Uh, there's no better place, no other place in the world which is as, um, as central to this kind of research as this place here. So this is... So I'm very happy to be here again. Um, what I would like to do just in 15 minutes is uh, just give a very short uh, introduction to what the Hermetica are all about for a somewhat lar larger audience. Many people in the audience here might already know what it's all about, more or less, but uh, maybe the larger audience doesn't. So um, what are the Hermetica all about? I'd like to uh, tell a little bit about this um, by, while at the same time also telling you about my, my personal interest and my own, uh, own development in my uh, encounters, my encounters with thrice greatest Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus, the, um, the legendary author of the Hermetic writings. Uh, I encountered the Corpus Hermeticum, the most central text of Hermetic writings, uh, by the end of the 1980s. Uh, in a Dutch translation, which was uh, made possible by the Bibliotheca Philosophica Hermetica here in Amsterdam, and the translation of the Corpus Hermeticum made by uh, um, Rolof van den Broek and Gilles Crispel, which was uh, of great importance for uh, you know, calling attention to the Hermetica in the, in the Dutch context. I got fascinated, I read these texts, I was wondering what is it all about, I couldn't really make out entirely what they were all about. There were many things that puzzled me about them, but I got fascinated and hooked about this text. Um, and um, 
what is clear in any case, these are texts that are attributed to a legendary author, Hermes Trismegistus, or in which this legendary author or wisdom teacher plays a central role. Uh, they were written in the second, third centuries of the common era, more or less, uh, in Greek, and, um, um, but they were written in Egypt. And this combination of Egypt and Greek is interesting and, and important for understanding what the Hermetica are all about, because uh, when you think of Greece, then you think usually about Greece, Greek culture as the origin of Greek rationalism, Greek philosophy, etc. And many people think that the whole of Western civilization began in Greece, right? So Greece has this kind of uh, iconic status of the or as the origin of Western philosophy uh, and rationalism. But then these, these texts were written in Egypt, and Egypt is often seen as the counterpart in that respect. Egypt is often perceived as the home of everything that's not rational and not philosophical, but uh, that has to do with magic and superstition and all kinds of things that were seen as the counterpart of rationality. And so the fact that the hermetic writings were written precisely in Egypt, but in Greek, and in Greek which uses a lot of philosophical language, is fascinating. Uh, so you have the, these two countries, Egypt and Greece, <laughs> together, so to speak, in uh, one corpus of text, the Hermetica. These texts are attributed to this legendary teacher, um, and uh, they are all about the search for gnosis, ultimate knowledge, knowledge about uh, the true nature of reality, the true nature of God, and the true nature of ourselves. And um, to already you know, give you very shortly the answer of um, what the quest for gnosis is all about. The ultimate um, um, answer that the hermetic uh, authors gave to the question, what is reality is all about, what is the true nature of reality, was that they said, everything is light. There is only one reality, spiritual light, which is universal. And um, God is light, reality is light, and the human being is light. The only thing that really exists is light, universal light. And they call that the nous, with a Greek word. Um, now, of course, when we're sitting here, do you look at each other and we are looking, we are standing in a room here and you see people, you see beautiful pictures at the walls, etc. You're not seeing light. Uh, you're, see, you're seeing all kinds of objects and people. Um, why is that? Well, that is because, according to the Hermetica, uh, we are not actually perceiving reality as it really is. We are deluded. So our state of consciousness in which we find ourselves is a deluded state, a state of, state of hallucination. And this is, these are really appropriate terms. Uh, a state of hallucination in which we see things that seem very real, but are not ultimately real. Because the only thing that's really real is universal light. That's also kind of core uh, belief of the hermetic authors. Um, so the question is, how do we uh, uh, wake up from the state of delusion and illusion in which we find ourselves, in which we think this is reality? And how do we find our way uh, towards a true perception of the true nature of reality, which is universal light. That was really what the way of Hermes was all about, and that is what you find in the Hermetic literature. So in the Hermetic literature, you find the description of an, what uh, is often described as the path of Hermes or the way of Hermes, in which um, the authors and the practitioners who wrote these texts were describing how you can uh, free yourself, liberate yourself from delusionary perceptions of reality and find your way to gnosis of reality as it really is. That's a kind of a core uh, summary of what our hermetica are all about. These are unique, profound, very fascinating texts. I have been studying them for decades now. And this is a corpus of texts that you can keep reading. Uh, there are many texts that you might come across when you read them a couple of times, you know what they're all about. These are texts that you can keep reading because they always keep surprising you. I've uh, written a pretty thick book about them um, and been doing little else than studying the Hermetica for five or six years. I'm absolutely sure if I uh, start reading the text, the, the text again, I will again discover new things that I didn't see before. Uh, because this is how fascinating and multi-leveled their Hermetic texts are. So these are classics. These are classics. Um, to say something else also about the reception of the Hermetica, because these are texts from the second, third century, late antiquity, uh, Egypt and the Roman Empire, very long time ago. Uh, 
many things happened with the Hermetic writings over the centuries. They got translated, they got copied by scribes, etc. A lot can, can be said about it. But a highlight of the revival of the Hermetic uh, literature came in the 15th century when the Greek texts, uh, especially the text that is known as the Corpus Hermeticum, mm -hmm. Uh, got translated into Latin by one of the great humanists in the, uh, of the Renaissance, Marsilio Ficino. And this famous translation came out in 1471, uh, known as the Pimander, uh, the book on the wisdom and uh, power of God, the famous translation of the Corpus Hermeticum. Now, I got fascinated by uh, the reception and the translation of the Hermetica in the Renaissance, in this period, uh, in 1997, and that's maybe a nice uh, small story to tell of how very small things that happen in your life can totally change your life forever. Uh, because I was living in Paris at that time, uh, I was one evening I was visiting a friend of mine, the famous scholar of the study of esotericism, Antoine Fevre, uh, who was a pioneering star, uh, scholar in our field. I was having a nice evening at home with him and I was looking um, at a little glass case that he had in his room, which had a collection of very old books, uh, very valuable old books, the kind of books that you find here in the Ritman Library. And one of them caught my interest for some reason. I took it out. It turned out to be a French translation from the 16th century of Hermetic literature. Mm -hmm. and, um, and somehow something tickled my interest. And I still think if I hadn't taken that book out, my life would have changed completely. It would have been, and I would not have done most of the things that I actually have done. I asked Antoine Fevre, can I borrow this book? Well, it's a valuable 16th century text, but he amazingly uh, you know, allowed me to take it home or with me to my room uh, that I had in Paris. And I took it with me and I was reading it, uh, in, uh, reading it in bed. I very well remember this. I couldn't make out most of it. It was written in 16th century French, very difficult. Uh, I didn't understand most of it, but I understand some of it and I noticed there's something about this text. There's something fascinating about it. It's a kind of an intuition that you can have sometimes. I want to know more about this. Uh, two weeks later, I went to Amsterdam and I went to the Bibliotheca Philosophica Hermetica here. And I met a um, uh, Neo-Latin translator who happened to be sitting there, Ruth Bouthorn. Uh, who was translating hermetic text into Dutch. And I asked, what are you, what, what are you doing? And he said, uh, well, I'm translating a text by Lodovico Lazzarelli. And then a little bell went off in my head because I had been reading this French text and this had been written by Loi Lazzarel. That is the French, the Frenchification, so to speak, of Lodovico Lazzarelli. And so this was a coincidence. I thought, I want to know more about Lodovico Lazzarelli. I started working with Ruth Bouthorn, and we ended up translating all the works by Lazzarelli uh, from Latin into English, wrote a large introduction about it, and published a book about this. And why was this so important? Well, uh, why was this so fascinating uh, to me, and why do I think it is important to say something about, about Lazzarelli? Well, there is, the famous, there is a famous narrative that has been told about the hermetic, traditions by, uh, the hermetic tradition by Francis Yates a great scholar uh, who published a masterpiece in 1964, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, in which he argued that the Hermetic, that the translation of the Hermetica in the 15th century um, was a momentous event in cultural history. Uh, the translation that Ficino made of the Corpus Hermeticum changed the nature of the Renaissance. It introduced magic uh, and learned discourse about magic into the intellectual culture and it had a huge impact on the entire early modern period and gave um, the starting point in many ways, according to Francis Yates, to the scientific revolution which far finally led to the modern world. So she created, she made this beautiful large grand narrative about the enormous impact of the hermetic literature, the hermetic tradition, which um, all started with the translation of this Corpus Hermeticum in 1471. Now, I was reading this Loi Lazarel, this Lodovico Lazzarelli, and I was looking him up in Francis Yates' famous book, and I could hardly find him. He was mentioned here and there in a few footnotes, but what I discovered was that this 
unknown guy, Lazzarelli, had been the second translator of the Corpus Hermeticum next to, uh, to Ficino. He had written some treatises that had not been included by Ficino. So it was not just Ficino who translated the Corpus, it was also Lazzarelli. Um, so I wanted to know more about Lazzarelli and to cut a very long story short, short because I, I just have a few more minutes. Um, it basically turned out that by looking at one forgotten figure, Lazzarelli in this case, when you actually start studying him and contextualize him and learn about him and learn about his work, you discover that the basic normative standard narrative that had so impressed countless people the narrative by Francis Yates had to be revised and her whole story, well, turned out to be very different from reality. So uh, basically on the basis of Lazzarelli, I came to the, uh, what I discovered at that occasion was how strongly scholars with their interpretation of ancient texts can determine the, uh, the, uh, the way that we look at history and sometimes their interpretations are wrong and have to be revised and then suddenly the whole picture changes. That, uh, that discovery has always, always stayed with me. Um, the whole story of the hermetic tradition that Francis Yates uh, was telling had, had to be revised on the basis of new discoveries of an unknown hermetic author, Lodovico Lazzarelli. Uh, much more recently, beginning in 2015 more or less, I decided to finally go back to this mysterious uh, hermetic texts themselves, the texts that were written in the second and the third century, really studied them very, very, very carefully, going back to the Greek, uh, Greek originals, looking at all the translations, the footnotes, the commentaries, and whatever is there, reading all the secondary literature. And again, I found that um, if, you, uh, if you delve deep into these texts, then you find that they are very profound, they are very deep, and you, you keep discovering the new things about them. But what struck me most is that, again, the way that we <coughs> look at these texts uh, is often determined by the narratives that, in this case, 20th century scholars have put on these texts. And often these narratives are wrong. And again, in this case, I uh, have been arguing, and maybe we can talk a bit more about it later, that uh, we have to look at this whole, whole hermetic literature from antiquity in a radically different way from how we used to. The text, and that's my final part of my little talk, these texts have often been described as the philosophical hermetica, so this, which, is, which suggests that these are philosophical texts. Um, I've come to the conclusion that these are actually not philosophical texts. They use philosophical language, Greek uh, philosophy, they use elements from, the, from Plato and, and the Platonic philosophy, but they are not interested in resolving philosophical questions in the way that standard philosophers are usually doing. They're interested in something else. They are using philosophy in order to find uh, answers to the question of what is the ultimate nature of reality, but most of all to find answers to how can we heal ourselves from our deluded consciousness and how can we find the way back to a direct perception of reality as it really is. So I've proposed to refer to this uh, corpus of philosophical hermetica as spiritual hermetica. This is not, these are not philosophical texts, these are what I call spiritual texts, which uh, are uh, centrally uh, <laughs> devoted to uh, try to transform our interior constitution to transform ourselves, to transform our minds and our whole consciousness in such a way that we uh, get liberated from deluded perceptions of the world and actually discover how reality really is. That is, uh, so that is what this text, in my view, are all about. Final thing I want to say is that um, so the ultimate reality that you discover by means of gnosis that is the central message of Theramatica, is that there's only one reality, and that is light, universal light. At the same time, uh, very often scholars have, have suggested that this means that human beings, according to the Hermetica, have to liberate ourselves from matter, from the material world, from the body, and find our way back to a non-material, an other world of pure spirituality. But I found that this is actually not what the texts say. They are actually about embodiment. They are not about escaping from the world towards another spiritual reality of pure light. 
they're actually about making contact with that reality and then channeling it into this world. So the Hermetica is actually an extremely world-affirming, positive worldview that uh, celebrates the beauty of existence, the beauty of reality, and uh, doesn't teach us to escape from the world, but actually um, tries to teach its <laughs> practitioners to transform the world, to make it better, to make it more beautiful, and to make it more true. Um, so non-duality, the reality of one reality of light, which is the only reality that really exists, one core element of Terramatica, and the other core, uh, core element is the task of trying to channel that universal light into our material world. And um, that, I think, is the core uh, concept, or the core concept of the hermetic, the hermetic spirituality that you find here. And as scholars, and that is what I do in my daily life, you can uh, trace how these texts with this strange and often misunderstood message get uh, interpreted, reinterpreted, passed on, often misunderstood or creatively re interpret it in all kinds of ways through the century until we reach the present day. And the reinterpretation of the Hermetica is still going on at this moment in all kinds of alternative spiritual circles. And maybe we will talk about this also uh, with Justin Svetch about this. So that was my s small introduction. Thank you. Um, what I want to talk about is a bit what Walter mentioned. Um, there's sort of what Hermeticism was and sort of what Hermeticism was in the ancient world, but there's also how we've received Hermeticism. What it was and how we received it are quite different things, as you can imagine. And what prompted this at some level was me thinking about how I use the word hermetic when I'm sitting down writing scripts for Esoterica. And what I discovered was that I use it in all kinds of completely different ways. This word took on so many valences of meaning, and I began to ask myself, where did some of these valences come from? And I think that question's incredibly complicated, and I'm gonna give you one tiny answer to where I think that may have come from. And where that answer comes from, I think at some level, that answer is very overdetermined, and this is just one piece of that puzzle, perhaps a footnote that could have been in Valter's book, in fact, is that we often find the Corpus Hermeticum and Hermetic literature traveling with other texts. Often scholars will talk about the Corpus Hermeticum as if it's sort of floating alone by itself, and in some editions it did. But in a great many editions, especially the editions that were very decisive and very popular, the Corpus Hermeticum is moving alongside as a fellow traveler to other texts. And as you can imagine, you know, many folks here have been painted like the friends you keep, the company you keep. We begin to be painted as the company we keep for better and, and, and for worse. So this text is a very important text in the history of all of this. This is a 1497 uh, Aldine. This is, uh, if you, if you, even folks here may recognize the type of uh, Aldus Montutius. Uh, this is a platonic primer. This was meant to be a, te a text, basically, that you would pick up and you would read before you read uh, Ficino's complete translation of Plato. Now, what's important about this text, is, by the fact that it's the first time that Iamblichus appears in print, this is where he gets famously the title De Mysteriis, is that you see a complete interesting collection, not yet with the Corpus Hermeticum, but a very interesting collection of all kinds of texts that... When you look at them, I bet you look at them and go, hermetic, right? They, kind of, they give you sort of hermetic vibes even though the Corpus Hermeticum isn't there. But what we have is De Mysteriis by Iamblichus. We have the commentary on the Alcibiades. We have Proclus's book on sacrifice and magic. What's also important about this is that many of these texts valence this collection a little bit magic-y. There's a little bit magic-y valence to these texts. So on Deities and Diamonds, on Dreams, on Diamonds by Michael Sellis, this is a famous sort of textbook of demonology, a Christian text, no less. Uh, one of the few only Christian texts in here. We go through and we get or a kind of grab bag of Platonic literature, or Neoplatonic literature, Pythagorean literature, that all is going to set the stage for Marsilio Ficino's translation of Plato's opera. Now, this text does not yet contain the Corpus Hermeticum, but it will in just a moment. But again, if you take a look at these texts, they're already beginning to take on some of the effects of what we now began to think about as kind of the thing that a Renaissance magus would want to pick up. In fact, if I were a Renaissance magus, I would be the first person in line to buy this compendium. In 1516, right, and just to FYI, see if I can pop back, this is just two years before Ficino dies. 
right? So just to get an idea, and also it contains one text by Ficino at the very end, just FYI. So already establishing. And just FYI, the Aldine Press uh, is funded by money from, uh, from the Della Porta family. So Giovanni Della Porta is actually knee deep in this from the very beginning. And the Aldine Press, which is quite famous, one of the most beautiful presses of all time, is already pumping out a book by Ficino in 1497, just a couple of years before he dies. In 1516, this edition is greatly expanded, and the Aldine Press logo is put right beneath it. Now, for my book nerds in the room, and I imagine there's at least one of you, <laughs> the symbol of the Aldine Press is a symbol of extreme quality. When you want to think about the engine of the Renaissance, it's the Aldine Press. They are pumping out Greek and Latin text in accessible, easy to read, very easy to read, relatively inexpensive volumes, and the Aldine Press will eventually give us small books that will become the background for what we now call paperbacks. If you wanted access to old wisdom, ad fontes, back to the sources, the Aldine Press was your go-to. And when the Aldine Press printed something, it meant it was worth reading. It was a classic. It was one of the sources. And there it is, right in the middle now of, whoops, I'm sorry, I don't have it written out here, but right at the very heart of this text is now Merki Trismegisti Pymander. It's now at the center of it. In fact, I have this at home. If you open it up to the center, Hermes Trismegistus is now at the beating heart of a platonic reader. Right follows it is the Asclepius, and then a grab bag, mostly of Ficino, well, all of Ficino, but many of Ficino's things taken from his three books on life, many of which deal with quasi-medical, quasi-magical ways of living. The text is now even more leaning in the direction of something like what a Renaissance Magus would want, including at its beating heart now, Hermes Trismegistus. So with the Pymander is now sitting at the very heart of what would be the book you would want if you were a John Dee, if you were a Gino de Bruno, if you were someone like that. This text is decisive in the history of all this because this is one of the first times where the Pymander will be printed with other texts. And this edition, in some form or fashion, is going to become one of the most best-selling editions of the Corpus Semeticum. Now, when we talk about editions of the Corpus Semeticum, we might say this is the 11th edition of the Corpus Semeticum, the 11th edition. When you hear that, what you're hearing is it's the 11th edition of the Corpus Medicum as if the Corpus Medicum is by itself. It's not. It's now traveling with a collection of books that are now shaping what Hermeticism is, what ad fontes means. So when you read books, like when you bury Proclus's book on magic and Celis's book on demons right next to Pythagoras, and that's now beginning to color what Hermetic's going to mean. Hermetic is now taking on a valence because now it's traveling with other books that are now coloring what it's going to look like. The 1516 edition would be now would be the last time that the Aldine Press would pick this up. The next edition of the Corpus Medicum, the very next edition of the Corpus Medicum, right, would now be printed in 1532, now switched over to Basil, and now look what's happened. All the Ficino's been dropped, so is the Michael Sellis on demons, maybe that made some people uncomfortable, demons have a tendency to do that, and Iamblichus and Pymander have switched pride of place. He now is no longer at the center of the collection. He is now at the top, and many of the things have been dropped, but not Iamblichus, not Proclus, including on spirits and on daemones, and on sacrifice and magic, probably one of the most popular books about sort of occultism in the, in the Middle Ages. This edition, with one, ed with one change we'll see in just a minute, this one right here is also very important because it follows a different manuscript tradition than the, 14, the infamous 1471 uh, edition of the Pymander. This edition never achieved great success as an edition. However, this edition did. Beginning in uh, 1549, this, uh, the center of location for this printing is now going to be switched over into France. And this edition, as you can see, has now switched Iamblichus for Pied of Place. Now he's now at the front again. And now, Hermes Trismegistus bookends the text. Michael Sellis has made a return on demons has come back. And what we have still, Porphyry and Proclus. Notice how much more magically inclined this collection is now than the first one. It's almost a plurality of the texts are dealing with demons and magic. And Hermes Trismegistus is now the bookend of the text. This edition, beginning in 14, 1549, 
would go into, I haven't counted them yet, but they would be editions printed almost every five years through the 17th century. Think about that time period, about 1549 into the sort of mid-17th century. That's the time period where we see a huge explosion in the interest of people like Dee and things like that. This text, I think, would have been the go-to text that you wanted to go to get access to this literature. This was an Octavo edition, very small, inexpensive. If you wanted a copy of the, of the Hermes Trismegistus, you wanted access to that ad fontes, you picked it up here. Now think about this from the point of view of the reader. To get to the Hermes, you have to cross this path if you're reading the book cover to cover. Imagine the primed, imagine what you're thinking as a reader, as your mind has been primed through this reading, and by the time you get to the, to the Pymander, imagine, to Valtra's point, imagine what you are now receiving. You are now reading the Pymander through this prism. And I think that's an incredibly important prism to understand. When we think about an edition of the Corpus Medicum, we have to think about how not only was it received, but literally how it was read in a book at that time. Understanding the book culture shapes how the understanding of these texts happened. And without understanding that book culture and this literature as it's put into this configuration, I think that tells us a great deal, or at least gives us part of a clue about how this hermeticism, whatever that means, is going to be received by readers and by people like who are going to be practicing hermeticism. Just to drive this point home and to make it a little bit more ancient and more, I mean, perhaps more interesting, uh, this is the edition, this is the text from the 1549. I think it would be an interesting thing for my folks out there who are mystically inclined toward hermeticism would be put yourself back into the 1550s, go meet all your 1550s buddies, start a reading group, and then read these texts in this order and see what it would have felt like intellectually to work through Iamblichus and to come through the Plato commentary on Plato's Alcibiades, which by the way is never, the Plato's Alcibiades is never read now. I went through five years of graduate school in philosophy and the only thing we ever learned about it was Plato probably didn't write it, right? But I tell you this, you know what the first book you read if you signed up to a Neoplatonism class by Iamblichus? You read the Alcibiades. Everybody read the Alcibiades. Now, nobody does, aside from specialists. So, and this, by the way, is a commentary on, uh, uh, particularly a commentary by Proclus on the Alcibiades. I challenge you, if you're interested in this, read, those, read these books in this order, because that's how someone like John Dee would have picked this book up. And he had this on a shelf, by the way. This is how he would have read it. So, gathering these books from the, from the past, we have to think about Hermes Trismegistus and the Pymander and his wisdom as not isolated into one book or one system of books, but buried among other books and relating intellectually and gaining a valence from these other books. This is nothing new. If we grind all the way back to the Nagamati Library, the only other place in antiquity, really, where we find hermetic text in situ, in the actual volumes, the physical Coptic volumes, we also find hermetic literature writing along other literature. Nagamati Codex 6 is a weird codex. I know that the Nagamati Codex is all kind of weird, but the Nagamati Codex 6 is especially unusual. It's the only one to have an ax. Thunder Perfect Mind is unlike any other text in the Nagamati Library, for folks who know it. It's beautiful. Maybe one of those beautiful texts of the ancient world. The authoritative discourse and the concept of our great power are also very odd <laughs> kinds of text. You probably, even if you're interested in Gnosticism, you probably haven't heard much about them. They're relatively brief, and they're relatively odd texts. There's a random chunk of the Republic, which has a very interesting valence when it's been translated into Coptic, and then the last three texts are Hermetic. I would say and argue that this is not new. In the same way that we can look through the printing history of the Corpus Hermeticum, we could probably assume at some level, at least from this one piece of evidence, that it may have not even in the ancient world traveled by itself. Mm -hmm. It may have always been a kind of ancient traveler. And what that means at some level is that whatever Hermetic meant, and to Valter's point, whatever Hermetism was in ipso, in itself, it probably always also floated as a signifier. It probably meant something different in different communities, in different textual contexts. It certainly meant something, you know, what connection in the, when the, when the when the, the codex writer was putting this together, 
What connection in their mind connected Thunder Perfect Mind to the discourse of the Agduad and the Ennead? I don't know. And I don't think it was random, but I don't know. And that's a great place to at least speculate. Why put them in this codex? And so what I want to say, as sort of a conclusion to wrap this up, is that the hermeticism that anyone has inherited is always floated in this way. It seems like we have evidence in the late antiquity for this. We have evidence in the history of printing for this. And I think that what's fascinating and what's exciting about that is that on the one hand, we can go to great lengths to do what I, what I would call forensic philosophy, the great work that Valter has done in his recent book to sort of forensically reconstruct hermeticism as it was in these texts. And what's interesting, I think, Valter, in your work is how also you take some texts and put them sort of closer to the periphery of what hermetism was and some outside of it, right? And even, and I think that's an interesting part of this, mm -hmm. like you have now also entered in, sort of rearranged them in a way that you think makes the most sense. And I like the fact that we could throw your, yeah. you could throw the diagram up here as well, mm -hmm. and it would be part of this history of how we've rearranged them to make them the hermetism we think is the authentic hermetism. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's a great, and I find your read very compelling, but it's an interesting part of sort of the, how we put these things together. We could throw vouchers up there as well. But what that means is that we have Hermeticism and Hermes and Hermes Trismegistus as something like we might call floating signifiers. They mean something. It doesn't, you can't say anything's Hermetic, but the exact meaning is always determined at some level by how we receive it. And how we receive it is often in history been through these bundles of wisdom, not, a, not in itself a bundle of wisdom. And that's exciting because it means that whatever Hermetism is or was, it's not hermetically closed. Is hermetically open. Thank you. <laughs> well, the cogs are turning with uh, all the information you've both given us. Um, I think you've really given us a good introduction to um, what the original practitioners of hermetic religion were after. Um, and centuries later, we've heard something about the reception. Um, obviously, this is not just a gap of time, it's a gap between lived religion and reception through texts. Um, and I, I wonder what, what needs these discourses, these traditions, this religion, or these thoughts <laughs> have served over the, over the centuries. And I think we can even extend that to scholars. I mean, this served something for Francis Yates as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd just be well. curious about both your thoughts about that. One thing I was thinking, uh, listening to your, to, to your wonderful story, is a story about how these texts travel, is, uh, is that in a certain way you are uh, giving new life to maybe to something of Francis Yates' narrative. Because I've been deconstructing Francis Yates' narrative, and you're in a certain way reconstructing it by saying this, uh, this hermetic literature uh, was read as in close connection with magic. Right with with magical text, uh, and text about demons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and so the interesting thing is that if you actually read the, the Corpus Hermeticum in the translation by Ficino, mm -hmm. then you find there's no magic in it. There's no magic anywhere. Um, so you find magic in the Asclepius, but not in the Corpus Hermeticum. And um, so, and also another thing is also that uh, it's um, that that has been a bit a bit forgotten. But uh, Ficino, mm -hmm. strangely enough. He translated it because, which, uh, because Cosimo de Medici uh, told him you have to translate it. Well, if your Mecenas tells you that, then you translate it. Uh, <laughs> that's very clear. So he did it. But uh, it seems that he wasn't very interested. And Cosimo de Medici also seems to, they do not seem to have been so impressed by the Corpus Hermeticum. They made no effort to translate it, to, uh, to print it. It wasn't printed. It got printed in 1371, years later by a pirated, in a pirated copy uh, by two other humanists who just rushed it through the press. And um, Ficino himself never tried to publish it. So I always get the impression that uh, for them, the Corpus Hermeticum was a bit of a disappointment, actually. Uh, didn't offer them what they had thought it would give them. But then it gets caught up in the whole, uh, you know, what, you're the, uh, what you've been telling us, all these, uh, all these new prints and new editions that travel with other texts, and you get this kind of, this kind of uh, her, yeah, hermetic, magical, hermetic, uh, you know, constellations. And, uh, and that is what Francis Chase talks about. Does that make sense? I think so. And I think, 
and if I could rewind this, I would go back to one of these uh, slides. And we look at that collection, and to us, I think, we think all of that makes sense, all that makes sense together. Pythagoras and Michael Sellis and uh, uh, Pacino and all that. But if you actually read those books, they don't sit comfortably together. Iamblichus didn't agree with Porphyry. Michael Sellis was a Christian. If you look at these texts, uh, Pacino wasn't really interested in, in, in hermetic ideas. It doesn't seem like they had a huge impact on him. What's interesting to me is that the printer thought they made sense to go together, yes. and that we look at them and they make sense together to us, but intellectually, they are, it's a very tense <coughs> conversation. Exactly. And, and I think what's interesting, right, is that what I'd point out is a dialectic, actually, between Francis Yates saying they're all connected, and I'm saying they're connected, but the connection actually isn't natural. It's a connection that makes sense, that made sense to a printer, and what's interesting is that we've inherited their decisions. It sounds like it was a marketing decision. It could have been. It could have been clickbait, right? Like demons and memories just against us. It could have been Renaissance clickbait for all I know. <laughs> but, um, ooh, demons. And, and, but what's interesting is that we've, we, we've inherited a decision that may have been made by two printers. Yeah. Or by two humanists who just yeah. Yeah, pi, they bootlegged the copy of the Pymander. Yeah, and, 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 and a defective and a copy. And a defective yeah. copy. Very defective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I think that that's, um, and, uh, and what's interesting is when it's a 1471 edition and when it's not. Um, yeah. And so I think what, for me, it's not so much a, a, a defense of the Yates position, it's a sense that it was natural for her to come to that position because that's how it traveled. And yeah. again, to going to point, back to your point about contingency. Yeah. The decision made by a printer in Aldous Mantutia's press in yeah. 1497 shaped how an entire generation came to view this collection of literature, despite the fact that that collection of literature had nothing to do with Michael Sellis, or had or nothing to do with Don Demons, or nothing to do with the Yablicus, or, um, or Porphyry for that matter. Yeah. And yet, that surveillance it got, right. because of the accident of history. But, and another effect of this was that certain other authors that should have gotten more attention were marginalized, because uh, so Lazzarelli, my guy, uh, really, um, he gets printed in the uh, you know, early 16th century, but he never, never got, the, got the popularity uh, that might have been gained by traveling with all these other guys. And, uh, and one reason is that there was no, nothing, nothing magical in him either. It wasn't in the Pimander, it wasn't in uh, Lazzarelli. No magic, but interestingly, and maybe as, an, as a footnote that's interesting, I think, is that, um, that the author who was most influenced by Lazzarelli, uh, but you can hardly tell this if you don't pay very, very close attention, is Agrippa. And Agrippa, the great author of the, you know, the three books on magic, uh, actually, uh, many of his core ideas come straight from, uh, from Lazzarelli, but uh, this is kind of an esoteric secret uh, in um, in Agrippa. You don't notice it unless you really study it very carefully. And it's so important to note that Lazzarelli's edition of the Corpus Medicum was complete. It had all 17. Yep. And he's the first person in history to say hermeticus sum. I am a hermeticist. That's true. Mm. No one, they, people said they were on the path of Hermes in antiquity. No one called themselves a hermeticist. But it's great because he says hermeticus sum et Christianus. That's an excellent point. That's, that's absolutely yeah. true. Uh, yes, he is the first to say that. And he believed also, uh, yeah, sorry to go on, but <laughs> Lazzarelli. We were both fans of Lazzarelli. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I am an hermetist. Yes, yeah. he said that. And a Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, he believed that uh, he had encountered the reincarnation of uh, Point Mandries, the teacher of Hermes in the Corpus of Medicum I, who, had, who was the same entity as Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So for him, Point Mandries was the Logos, was Christ, who had now, <laughs> now returned in his own time as this wandering preacher, uh, Giovanni da Correggio, who was his master, his guru. Mm. And um, so he believed that Christ and, and Poimandras had returned in his own time, so the end of time was near. Uh, yeah. Who was so, so, un so it was so unusual that scholars doubted he really existed for a while. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Be that unusual, yeah. that in the future people doubted you really were real. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I wanted to go back to, to your explanation, Valta, about what, um, about what the original, um, people on the path of Hermes were after, and you said, light. Yep. And I thought, what is this light? Is yep. it an experience? Uh, what is the light? Uh, and to what extent is it uh, a factor for these later people? I mean, maybe these Christians also saw this light, and of course there are many passages in the Bible, mm. Christ is the light of the world, and so yeah. forth. Um, but what do you think they understood this light to be? Well, uh, 
Yeah, uh, this is this, this is I think a core point. Uh, the, the most important uh, word I think in hermetica is nous. Yeah. The Greek word nous. That is the core text. If you don't get the, the, the core word. If you want to understand the hermetica, you have to start understanding what nous means in Greek. Now, if you, uh, if you open it up in, up in the Greek dictionary, uh, dictionary and you look up the word nous, the dictionary will tell you it means mind or it means intellect. And so you immediately, and that's also what you find in all the modern translations. Uh, nous gets translated as mind or intellect. And immediately everything starts looking very philosophical to us because well, we know what intellect is, right? We have an intellect, we are intelligent, we have a mind, it's in our brain. These are all, this is all very familiar language to us. So we read this word about the nous, and we think we know what it means. I'm arguing we do not understand at all what it means when we translate it as intellect or mind, because it meant something else. And in order to find out what it meant, you have to uh, read the text themselves and you have to have to, to let their hermetic authors tell you what news means to them. And forget about the dictionary translation for a moment. And if you read, read it carefully, then I think the only conclusion you can draw is that this is what it means. There is such a thing as a universal divine light. God is light. This is not, of course, the light that comes from the lamps here. This is a spiritual reality of light, which you, uh, which you can only perceive, which you cannot perceive with your natural senses, with your eyes. You can only perceive it by an inner uh, sense, the, an inner kind of visual, visual sense, which again is called nous. So you can only understand the light of divinity with the light of your own mind or your own nous. Mm -hmm. uh, so your own nous, your own light, your own inner light is the light by which you see the light, uh, if that makes any sense. Uh, but this light is not natural light, it is a spiritual light, and it is the only, is the essence of what God really is. And, um, but it is not just a philosophical concept, it is something that is being seen, uh, you know, according to the Hermetica. So at the very beginning of Corpus Hermetica 1, the Poimandris, uh, in the very first uh, verses, you will find that the visionary uh, Hermes probably is in a kind of an, yeah, an altered state of consciousness, in an ecstatic state. His bodily senses are on shutdown, so to speak. Uh, his nous um, soars high, he says, and um, at one point he um, gets to see, no, I should say differently, he gets to see an enormous being, a great entity, uh, who introduces himself as Poimendris, this great entity uh, who talks to him and asks him, what do you want to know? And he says, I want to know the nature of reality and I know, want, to, want to know what God is. And then uh, Poimendris changes his appearance and uh, then Hermes sees a universal light, uh, which, and he, he um, spontaneously feels feelings of love for that light, and that is the news. So what actually happens is that that Parmenides is the noose. He changes his appearance and he shows what he really is: mm. universal light. Mm. So if you ask me what is it, yeah. uh, the, herm the, the hermetic authors would tell tell you there's only one way to know it, and that is by experiencing it. Yeah. And then you will know what it is. It is not what comes out of these lamps. But what you describe sounds a lot like what you can read in. Meister Eckhart, in ah. Tauler, in Suzo. Yeah. And by the way, they're all also in all the encyclopedias of philosophy. Right. So I, you know, I don't yeah. see the problem with uh, philosophy and religion. Well, the problem is that is not th th the problem is that um, we easily get uh, sidetracked because yeah. we think that we know. When you hear the word intellect, they think, oh yeah, I know what intellect is. Mm -hmm. and, and we tend to uh, take an anachronistic perspective and to to project our modern understandings of intellect, intellectual, intellectualism, intellectual rationality. rationality mind, we tend to project it onto the text, and and then and that uh, keeps us very easily from reading what what are they actually telling us that it means, and we we just pass our own meanings over the meanings that they're trying to. This is exactly to what the examples you showed um, illustrate. <laughs> I think it's an example of what we sometimes in philosophy call the dictionary fallacy. It's if, if I, we're having a debate about something and you say, well, the dictionary says it means this. 
Dictionaries tell us how words are used, not what they mean. Mm -hmm. ah. Meaning is only determined by context. Mm -hmm. And if you go to a dictionary to look up the word noose, and it says intellect, you're like, well, settled. Like, yeah, words change meaning, and depending on context. And when you have an incredibly technical context, like what the, was happening at the Corpus Medicum, you're committing the dictionary fallacy. Mm. Okay. okay. Well, I have a whole list of questions here, and we could go on all night, but I'm pretty sure uh, the audience has a few questions, too. Corey? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, um, I have a question, Valter. You mentioned in your remarks that um, the Hermetica are basically an inexhaustible uh, fount uh, or source for different interpretations as you read them later. Um, could you maybe give an example of one of your interpretations that changed as a consequence of later reading or as you develop or a sort of changing uh, of one of your conclusions? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That was actually one of the questions that we thought about earlier. How have you changed your mind? And I might as well, well interpret it so like that. Yeah, um, I've become extremely interested over the past 20 years or so for all kinds of reasons in the concept of um, alterations of consciousness or altered states of consciousness. That has become a major uh, concern, concern for me, a major prism for reading um, materials that I study. and. Um, and uh, when I read this text in the 1990s, that concept was not on my radar. Uh, but later, later it came on my radar. And um, so what I have been arguing in this book, uh, which has the subtitle Altered States of Knowledge in Late Antiquity, um, is that um, uh, you know, anything that we can know at all uh, yeah, depends on our state of consciousness. So at this moment, I am in a sober state of consciousness, I am quite sober and focused. I'm wide awake. I've had a cup of coffee. Uh, I uh, can see you guys. I can, uh, I can gain a lot of knowledge at this moment. By looking at you, I know what you look like. I can, I can, I can see the trees outside, etc. That's knowledge that's accessible to me in this state of mind. I can also, in the state of consciousness, I can also sit behind a computer and start writing a scholarly article. And that goes very well in this state of consciousness, right? But if you are in a radically altered state of consciousness, like, for instance, the state that Hermes describes in the first treatise of the Corpus Hermeticum, an ecstatic state, then um, in that state, you know, forget writing an article or uh, that kind of thing. You cannot do that. But uh, so there are certain kinds of knowledge that are not accessible to you then, but others, the other kinds of knowledge are accessible to you. So at that, in that state, he suddenly can uh, see the news and he can see poimandries. And in our state of consciousness now, we cannot see the news uh, of our matters. We do not see the universal light, right? So, uh, so the point is that as we change our consciousness, our state of consciousness, certain uh, types of knowledge become accessible to us, and other types of knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge become un inaccessible to us. And um, this, for me, has become an, uh, a key for understanding the Hermetica. It's something that I didn't see in the past, I began to understand that uh, the, uh, that a number of key texts of the Hermetica, especially Corpus Hermeticum 1, Corpus Hermeticum 13, and the treatise on the 8th and the 9th of Nakhamedi, really are uh, the descriptions of radical alterations of consciousness, which allow radically different types of knowledge, which, can, uh, which are only accessible in that state, and not in another state. And this relates to a concept that I find fascinating, uh, this idea of state-specific knowledge. So this idea that certain kinds of knowledge are specific to this state of consciousness, other states of knowledge are specific to other states of consciousness. And is there a state in which any kind of consciousness is accessible to you? Mm. I doubt it. So I, I personally doubt it. I think that any knowledge that we have is dependent on the state of consciousness that you're in. And this, for me, has, uh, has become kind of really a key uh, for reading the Hermetica. And of course, everybody reads the text from their own perspectives. And I've been criticizing a lot of earlier scholars who read the text through their own biased perspectives and misunderstood them. And no doubt people will, will say at one point, Wouter Hanegraaf is, uh, is misinterpreting because he has his interest in altered state of consciousness possible. <laughs> but, uh, but at least it's another kind of reading which I think makes sense. So 
-hmm. I hope that's an answer. Justin, do you want to answer the same question? Has your thinking changed uh, over time about these things? Yeah, very dramatically, actually. I remember in undergraduate, first discovering the Corpus Medicum and just being blown away by it, just being like, this is amazing. And just thinking it was such, you know, part of it motivated me eventually to coming to study under, under Valter here at the HHP. And then I went to graduate school and I discovered this thing called Middle Platonism. And I started reading Middle Platonists, like Numenius and uh, Philo. And then I looked back at the Corpus Medicum and thought to myself, this is bad philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is just like, this is just like low brand, you know, Numenius. Um, and then uh, maybe five years ago or something, it sort of dawned on me, this is soteriology, not, not philosophy. Sure. Mm. And that shift to this is soteriology, this is philosophy in the, in the service of soteriology. Right. Then the text spoke to me again. And that was why I was so excited when your book came out, because I got affirmed. I got, you know, when you, about, when you come to an idea and then Walter Arnogoff like, writes a 300 page book and is like, you're like, ah. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, and so I, I, it, it's that, it was for me that progression. What an amazing text. Then I had my Pacino moment. Where I was like, eh, not such an amazing text. And then I was like, ah, it's amazing for reasons I didn't appreciate. The failure was a, a, my inability to see it for what it was. Mm -hmm. It's a text of soteriology, a collection of soteriology and phenomenology. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. That insofar as it's a text of soteriology and phenomenology, mm -hmm. bam. It, it hit me again. So it's a all disappointment, all dialectics. Yes. Hi, um, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, you just men mentioned uh, Meister Eckhart. And actually, uh, I wrote something about Marguerite Perret, and um, she might have inspired him. I think she did. Super biased. But um, what actually, what the whole news, um, um, the way you describe it, really made me think of the concept of love. Uh, yeah. By Marguerite Perret, actually, um, the same type of sorry, the same type of um, attributes and uh, w you know what it does, uh, what love does is kind of similar to what news does. It's like kind of knowing uh, a kind of a, a circuit between um, the soul and God, and that in the end, um, the eye that sees is the same eye that looks. This, these type of things you also find in Neoplatonic uh, things a lot. So I was just wondering, did you ever? made this connection yourself, or how do you view love or eros in this whole mm. hermetic um, constellation? Mm. I mean, I, I guess to, the, the, this is the minimistic, some of my favorite, Heidewig is perhaps my, one of my favorite poets of all time. Uh, I was just at the Berlinhof uh, the, today, and it's one of my favorite places in Amsterdam. I love Heidewig, uh, it's just one of my favorite poets. I think that there is a kinship between mystical Christianity and hermeticism. And I think the proof of that is that we have Hermeticism at all. It, when it passed through the Byzantine filter, which changed it, right? And I, I call it the Byzantine filter, but really the Byzantine filter took things out and added things in. And Michael Sellis probably was somewhere in there, maybe. But I think that the reason why it survived, for instance, in Lactantius, and the reason why, and Augustine really hated it, but it survives a bit positively in Lactantius and Stobaeus, and eventually it, it does cross that Byzantine hump is because there is enough philosophical kinship between certain strains of Neoplatonic Christianity and certain readings of the Corpus of Medicum that they, if you kind of squint and look at it sideways, it, it, it passes a smell test. Otherwise, if it didn't pass that smell test, I don't think the Byzantine editors would have ever let it get through. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for whatever reason, it, it was, there was something, there was a kinship enough that they were able to squint at it, look sideways, tweak it a little bit, mm -hmm. and then pass it on with a kind of an imprimatur stamp. And I think the, the evidence that there's a, a kind of intellectual connection is the fact that we have it at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to add something else also. Maybe um, one possible angle to look at this is uh, using modern research on neurology and uh, brain, brain process, et cetera. And uh, there is right, quite some evidence to assume that certain kinds of states are simply possible because our brain is able to produce them. And so it's possible that, and, and this remains speculative, but it's possible that uh, Marguerite Porret had similar kind of experiences as are described in the Corpus and Medicine. 
and uh, so it's, it does not just have to be an, uh, an, a question of borrowing from one source to another. It can also, uh, it's also possible that certain kind of uh, mental states are, have a certain kind of universality because they are based upon how the brain works. It's possible. I just throw this in here as a possibility. Uh, with respect to love, um, in the Hermetica it's complicated. They don't use the word love so much. Uh, there is a notion of platonic love in the sin sense of the desire for ultimate beauty that you want to, uh, want to attain. But I think more important in the Hermetica is the opposed sense that uh, the source of reality, which is the pega in Greek, the source, which is a name not just for God, but the source that out of which God himself comes maybe, the ultimate mystery of existence, uh, the pega they call it. Um, they describe it as a kind of a boundless source of creativity, of manifestation. Everything comes out of it, and uh, everything is produced by the pack and by the source out of pure generosity and pure, uh, you know, giving. So it is a very positive idea that uh, out of pure goodness, the source generates reality for our enjoyment. And um, so, uh, there is good reason to uh, interpret this as the source is a source of love, of, uh, of the love for existence, for anything that flourishes, that lives, that is beautiful, etc. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Thank you very much for uh, the highly interesting uh, lecture. I have uh, a couple of comments or questions. First, uh, the thing about uh, dictionary meaning of, of words, like you can look up news, psyche, whatever, and it will not do. I totally agree. You have to read these terms in, in context. And I also think that uh, in appropriate translations of the Hermetica, these terms should perhaps not be translated into modern languages. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So, but, but are there any modern English translations of the Hermetica that can be recommended. I have uh, read several, and uh, they are all different in some, in, uh, some aspects. I personally think that there is no uh, really satisfactory uh, modern translation of the Corp Corpus Hermeticum uh, at this moment. I think they're all highly problematic. Uh, for an, that's not a criticism for the, uh, for the, you know, through the translators. They're doing their best, but they're doing their using certain procedures, for instance, translating everything as intellect, et cetera, which I think uh, distorts the meaning. Yeah. Uh, I, I can already give, I can, however, give good, give good news. There is a uh, new translation coming up by Christian Wildberg, which will be published in one or two years. And uh, I've seen some uh, chapters of it. It's excellent. It's better than all the other ones that I've seen. And there's something very interesting also, which touches a bit on the whole transmission of text that you're, you're, you're referring to. Um, and that's a point that he has highlighted, namely in the transmission of the text. Very often a scribe copies the text and then makes annotations in the margins. What has happened, and everybody has overlooked this uh, until Christian Wildberg, is that the next scribe often uh, moves that annotation uh, into the main text. And then another scribe thinks it belongs to the text. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, so, the, so there are many the pieces of the Hermetica that actually do not belong there, and but have, have been misinterpreted as belonging to the Hermetic text. It results in all kinds of uh, grammatical mistakes. Sometimes the text doesn't make sense. Corpus Hermeticum III is a notorious example. Uh, it is full of grammatical inconsistencies. You cannot read it. But uh, he has reproduced uh, or reconstructed this text by putting all the marginalia back into the margins and reconstructing the original text. And suddenly it's a crystal clear text and all the problems have vanished. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is not just for Corpus Hermeticum III, that's for a whole series of other texts. So this is a revolutionary new translation that's coming up very soon. It's going to change our view of the Hermetica. Uh, uh, that's great news. Yeah. And, uh, and Asclepius too is also very yeah. defective. Yeah. 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 And I also said the Asclepius too is very defective. Oh, it's oh, a mess. Uh, it's, been, it's been known to be a mess for centuries. It's a mess, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah, and my second question is about uh, the arguments for a non dualistic reading of the Hermetica. I find that very interesting. Mm -hmm. The arguments for that? Argu arguments for a non dualistic reading. What my arguments are? Uh. 
what I've been, what I've just been trying to do is hermeneutics. I talk a lot about hermeneutics. I use Gadamer, etc. And uh, I've just been trying to understand these texts on their own terms. I've been trying to understand what are they trying to tell me. I've tried to bracket any kind of a, uh, prejudices that I could think of, that I could identify that might that I might be, uh, be projecting on them and try to let the text speak to me. And um, this is the conclusion I draw. This is, the, yeah, for the argument you will have to read the whole book, but, uh, I, but I think once you see that they're talking about, uh, about, about non-dualism, that that is their background metaphysics, all kinds of questions fall into place. As there have been this heavy uh, dualistic, gnostic frames put on it. So people have wanted to see a gnostic and dualistic gnostic matter against uh, spirit kind of narratives on the Hermetic and Hermetica. It doesn't work. It no. cannot account for many of the texts. And if you take a non-dualistic reading, I think it resolves, well, I would say 95 yeah. Yeah, percent of the problems. There are a few tricky cases. I can understand that I totally agree with you. Thank you very much. And I would say too also, Valter, what's interesting about this collection and, and Nagamati 6 is that we typically think of Gnosticism, whatever that category is, yeah. as dualism. These texts are interesting because as a bag, these are not terribly dualist texts. Yeah. And I think the fact that these three are at the end is not an accident. That this bag is, is an interesting sort of non-dualistic bag of things going on. That's interesting. I have to have to follow up on that. Thunder Perfect uh, Mind is a great text that really undermines yeah, yeah, yeah. dualisms and things like that. So I, mm. I think that part of what may have been mm. motivating this author may have been mm -hmm. these texts are unusual in that respect, and they all got thrown into the grab bag of Codex 6. Mm. That's an excellent suggestion. I'm going to, to follow up on that. And well, it occurs to me that we have a really full room tonight, and that indicates something, namely the fascination um, with this material. And Justin, you have a lot of interaction with, with your followers, and I just wonder what you think, where does this fascination come from with these stories and images and the material in general? I, I, one of the, my favorite groups of people to interact with on the internet uh, which is which is sometimes can, a difficult thing to say that because they interact with people on the internet. But I think one of the most exciting groups of people that I've got to interact with on the internet are the what I would call sort of neo hermetic folks uh, that are on the uh, hermeticism subreddit who are big fans of you, but also sort of reviving a form of hermeticism. And it's it's fascinating watching them interact with your work, with my work, as they grapple with that problem. And I think that they they are willing to do that frankly, spiritually athletic work. It is, a, you know, to, it's one thing for scholars to reconstruct and talk about, there's another thing to try to live it. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. an amazingly heroic, I think, and, and, and deeply athletic thing, spiritually. I think what people are finding so fascinating about it is that it is a Western non-dualism. Those are rare <laughs> sense, you know, Plato in some sense. And um, there is something that combines, to your point earlier, something about the machinery of Greek philosophy, which is very, very powerful, with something of the spirituality or, or whatever word we want to use of ancient Egyptian spiritual technology. And that's, a, that's just a cocktail worth drinking, right? Greek philosophy, <laughs> Egyptian spirituality, a, a, in, in this really deeply sy sympathetic, synthetic form, I think that just excites a lot of people because it's a powerful uh, monistic alternative to uh, to something like the Abrahamic faiths, which have frankly done a lot of harm to a lot of people. And so it gives them an avenue in their own Western tradition to have access to a spiritual technology that combines so much of what people are craving. And I think that's why people are willing to do the, in my opinion, again, very impressive, very admirable work of bringing these traditions back into a kind of, of, of neo, neo hermeticism. And, uh, I'm just incredibly impressed by, by folks willing to do that work. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the term spiritual technology is a very nice one. It is also, uh, Foucault uses an almost uh, similar kind of term, which is very applicable here. And I think one reason is simply that a lot of uh, modern practitioners, yeah, they're practitioners, they're maybe interested in reading ancient texts, but they're really interested in experience and practice. They want to do it. They want to have the experience themselves. Last week, just last week, it was fascinating. I got an email from a guy in Venezuela that I don't know, who first wrote to me under a secret name, uh, a ritual name, because he's a member of, an, uh, of a society. Uh, they, they, used, they call themselves the University of Alchemy. 
uh, in, in Spanish. And it turns out that these are people uh, in Venezuela who are, uh, they con he contacted me because he had read the book, uh, but for years already, um, they have been uh, practicing rituals uh, with an Amazonian drink, which some of you may know about, uh, ayahuasca, which is quite well known now. And they are using ayahuasca in a ritual setting, so ayahuasca has a mind-altering uh, effect. And they are using the text of the Corpus Hermeticum uh, as their basic template for drinking ayahuasca in a ritual context. So they are using Corpus Hermeticum 13, there is the hymn that they, that they, about the daimonas yeah, yeah. and all that. And they are doing this in order to um, expel the demons from their body and, to, and invite the forces of light into their body. That's what you read in Corpus Hermeticum 13. And they are really, they're just pract they're practicing this. Uh, so this is how, how the hermeticism you know, continues in completely new context in Venezuela. It's a bit stronger than Kufi incense, I imagine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, right. So yeah, this was fascinating. I heard this last week. Yeah. And again, that's, and I think what's fascinating about that is that, that the, what, of all the things we know about these spiritual technologies was that they are highly syncretistic, and technologies are all about what's effective, not dogma. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. exactly. like, if it's effective, ayahuasca is getting you to snooze. Yeah. I imagine that in Egypt, if they had ayahuasca, you best believe that it, they would, and, they, and we do know they were using kufi incense and other kinds of things that have these kinds of, uh, these kind of powers. So, to me, that's that people would say, oh, that's a, a, a weird innovation. I'm like, that's what technology is. Exactly. This might be actually the perfect place to interject my question, because um, while you were talking about um, Poimandris being identified as being Christ, I was reminded of one of your recent YouTube videos where you were talking about uh, Apostle Paul's vision of uh, Christ. Uh, legitimizing him to be uh, spreading the gospel, even though he never met him. But you connected that to an ancient Jewish tradition of uh, uh, Merkaba meditation kind of things. And there, in, in that context, I was wondering, I, I, I was thinking about like this uh, rabbi from Israel, Shannon, who was thinking about that the ancient Israelites might have been drinking uh, an anawaska, like uh, from Syrian rue and acacia wood where you can make DMT and like make a similar kind of brew so that there's like the possibility and then like you have the other work of Mararescu recently, the uh, Immortality Key about the early Christian sects being offshoots of uh, mystery schools from uh, the Greek world where it's also really quite uh, possible that they were imbibing certain uh, concoctions uh, that made them, uh, 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 carried them to the chariot of God, or however you may call it. In uh, uh, So I was wondering how, how you were thinking about this in uh, uh, the broader context of uh, these, the hermeticism and altered states and the secrecy behind it. I mean, I would say that there are certainly psychotropic substances being used, whether it's alcohol or kufi incense and other kinds of uh, incenses that, you know, the cannabinoids that were found recently at Telerad. Um, certainly they're being used. The question is where do we have evidence for it? And when we fill the gap of evidence of speculation, it's really important to, to name that as speculation. Mm -hmm. The Merkava mystics never mention, in, we, we get some list of the techniques they used, but they're, they look a lot more like yoga than they do imbibing certain kinds of substances. What I would say is though, that the Hermetica literature, Merkava literature, there's just a bunch of different technologies of, of ascent that are going on in this period. And I think it's in some level being motivated by the crisis of the third century. And that by in, in, the third, in the third century, you had a lot of reasons to want to get out of town. And the Jews had their way to get out of town, and the Hermeticists had their way to get out of town. Everybody's looking for a way out of the crisis of the third century. And I think that that, that may be also part of it. But for me, it would be the question of where do we have evidence? And when Yamblichus tells us that this instance is being used, we need to chase that to the very end, and we need to be especially attentive of it because there's been such an anti-psychedelic, anti-substance uh, uh, anti bias in academia for so long that I think we need to double down on those efforts to, to give that a fair play. But yeah, Gather, are you, find yeah, out what you was must, really happening. Yeah, you must find, an, uh, find a middle ground here because, uh, because you're quite right. There's no evidence in the Hermetica, uh, zero, nothing. Uh, in Jamblichus, you have a few references. At one point, twice, he mentions some concoction, something, and we do not know what it is. 
and I do interpret Jan Bilges as an uh, as an practitioner of the Hermetica. So that's that's puzzling. It's interesting, but we simply don't know more. Kufi uh, incense, yes. There are some other things I talk about this, but the evidence is very hard to interpret and it's very minimal. So I very very much agree with you. We 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 should not project these things on the on the materials if we don't have evidence. At the same time, you're also right. There is this kind of anti-energetic uh, kind of bias in scholarship, which doesn't want to see it at all. Um, and I try to push back against that a little bit in my book. On the other hand, there's also, you mentioned by Moro Resco uh, and other people, there's also an, uh, an other kind of bias which wants to see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, Bayern is, an, uh, I think, an example of that. It's an interesting book, but it's full of rhetoric, but the actual evidence is very, very slight. There's one piece of evidence that's very, very interesting that he has, has discovered for the, for the Illusionian mysteries in Spain. That is, I think, Fascinating. For the rest, I'm not so uh, not so convinced. So I think we have to find a balance between this tendency of wanting to see anthropogens everywhere and wanting to see them nowhere. I think we have to see them where they uh, where we have evidence, or where we are uh, have good reason to assume that uh, this is an credible hypothesis. Right. And I, I, I tend to call this uh, a spectrum because I get comments that you know I, I, every episode I do I get it was DMT. Uh, and, and, I, I, and I call this, on the one hand, this, I call it psychedelic eliminativism, where we want to eliminate all psychotropic drugs from history, but the other is what I call DMT reductionism. It was always just DMT. <laughs> and so I, psychotel, psychedelic eliminativism, uh-uh. Yeah, but also DMT reductivism, uh-uh. Uh, it's it's going to be more complicated than that. I was always wondering, like, in, uh, uh, I haven't really found any references to this, but every time I read uh, in the Bible, in Daniel 5.13, there's this story about Nebuchadnezzar calling upon the, the, uh, the, the, the barrels from the temple of Solomon to be carried, and then they drink from it, and their knees start trembling, and then the hand of God announces the doom of his failed kingdom. And that sounds an awful lot uh, about like a, a, a psychedelic trip gone wrong for Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, so in that sense... Or just like, a lot of wine. <laughs> Yeah, but like if you also see like evidence that in Galilee, like lots of traveling mystics from Galilee used lots of uh, potions that had way more than just wine, in the sense that some that's, that's, that's like not that weird, like maybe modern. Well, I think we agree and that we have to fight a bit. Yeah, we yeah. yeah when we when when we see Yamblichus use a word that we don't understand, then we have to stand in the presence of unknowing, and it, at least again double down on the possibility and chase it to the very end. But often, at least in my experience doing this research, and Valtra, I don't know about yours, often the very end is, I don't know. Yeah. The evidence is simply inconclusive. But there are cases, I mean, it is, so the tendency of not wanting to see it at all. Right. I am discussing um, the text uh, in, in the book, which is not hermetic, but it's in the Greek magical papyri, as they are called, uh, the so-called Mithras liturgy. And that's an interesting case because this is a, fa this is a famous text. Uh, it has been commented on by many scholars. It's really a well-studied text. And, well, to the best of my knowledge, I found almost nobody who mentions the entheogenic uh, component there. And it actually contains, there's one-fifth of the complete text uh, consists of a recipe of how to make mm -hmm. a psychedelic uh, concoction. It's, the recipe is there. You have to take this, you have to take that, you have to put it together in this way, etc. There are a couple of ingredients that are not identified, so we cannot replicate it. Uh, but there is one-fifth of the text is a recipe, and almost all the scholars have ignored it. Mm -hmm. And I find that uh, a very strong example of... of I, I agree. Of or Della Porta. There's a psychedelic drug in Della Porta that people yeah. just ignore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Kind of like, uh, they, he gets all this phrase, but it's like, how to go insane for a day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. believe it or not, we're already running out of time. So <clears throat> maybe the people who have already, that you've already recognized. And then I have one more question that I think we really need to ask before we let these two guys go. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting lecture. I have two questions. One goes back to, uh, I think, uh, the comment you made about uh, the man who said he was both a hermeticist and a Christian. I was uh, wondering about what time uh, that was written, mm. and uh, that goes with how we receive hermeticism. Mm -hmm. Like, whole Europe was Christian. Yeah. These texts are rediscovered 
they are cared for in such a way because they recognize each other. They become great friends. And I wonder how you see how that evolves, if it does, into uh, the emergence of, for example, Rosicrucianism. And then another question I have, perhaps more uh, for you, uh, Wouter. Um, if the Hermeticists had this non-dual view and they didn't have this, uh, um, you know, antagonism between matter and spirit, uh, I was reading uh, the Timaeus of Plato, and that's quite difficult to get through. But the the notion that that the the the, the ideas are impregnated into the the matter, the the sort of underlying substratum, the virgin matter of creation, then giving rise to the sun or the form, how, how that plays a role, if it does, in, in the hermetic worldview. Um, those are my two questions. Thank you very much for your uh, talks. Yeah, I think here, uh, so Jemblichus, I think this is one of the key references for Jemblichus. And I do, uh, I do interpret in my book uh, Jemblichus as a hermetic practitioner. I go, I'm very insistent on this. He, uh, he talks about our hermetic mysteries in his book. People have often wanted to keep him out of Egypt because Egypt is magic and superstition and uh, he's a philosopher, so he shouldn't go there, but he actually went there. I think he lived there and he studied there. And I have arguments for this. And, um, uh, and uh, yeah, so this is where you find this idea that, that, that the ideas or the, the good, the beautiful, and the true, the ultimate realities have to be have to get embodied into, into matter. Uh, so you find it there. So yeah, and the Tanias is a key reference. So I totally agree. <coughs> and you know, the other question is, yeah, so this guy was Latourelli, and yes, he was a Christian. And uh, interesting for him, so this was the 1480s, all right. Um, but interesting was that um, he was not interested in Plato, he was not interested in other uh, you know, Platonic philosophies, Yamlikas or whatever. So it's just the Bible and the Hermetica. That, uh, that was mm. it, was it for him. That is what interested him. And he, uh, he was reading his understanding of Christianity back into the Hermetica, or maybe giving a Hermetic interpretation of Christianity, or whatever, once you, you want to see it. And uh, yes, this was radical and relatively new in the way that he did it. And I would say also about the Timaeus is that Plato, there's a, there's a, Plato can never make his mind up. In, in the, in the Phaedrus, right, matter is pretty evil. And in, in the Timaeus, it's just limited. No matter how good of a builder you are, if the thing you have to build with isn't very good, the house will always be imperfect. It's just a limitation. So in the Timaeus, it's a limitation. It's, there's no dualism in the, in the Timaeus. Iamblichus really wants to go with a full embodiment of the soul. It's, it's completely sunk into the body, unlike Plotinus who wants to say, not completely funk, right? And you turn inward and da 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 da. I think that this is, a, just a, this is a tension inside of, this is a tension inside of Platonism that we don't talk about because we talk about Neoplatonism as if it's a thing. It's an 18th century invention that covers over the fact that this tension plays itself out in Porphyry and Iamblichus. And I think that Iamblichus falls on the side of the Corpus Medicum because the Corpus Medicum is precisely what you argue. It's a text about the, the, the goodness of the world and precisely as embodiment. And I think that's why he leans hard on the Timaeus and not so hard on the Phaedrus. And he leans also hard on the, on the, on the symposium. Yeah. Uh, because in the symposium, uh, Diotima, and I find it relevant that, uh, that a female um, uh, priestess of the mysteries is initiating Socrates there into what it is all about. And this is not philosophy, but it is erotica. It is ta erotica, it's erotics. And she explains what it's all about, and what she says, it's about um, giving birth in beauty. That is the formulation. Um, so uh, it is not about escaping from the world, it's, it's giving birth to the higher forces, to the ideas, into the world. So she used the language of uh, giving birth uh, to explain what the key of, of Platonic wisdom is all about. And I find it's extremely as significant uh, for understanding the Hermetica. We actually have a question from, from somebody in the, in the remote audience asking about if some of the, if some of the um, well-known Platonists could have had um, teachers who were versed in Hermetic traditions. When, uh, one of the Plat 
sorry, of the Platonic. So, for example, no. um, do you believe that someone like Pythagoras had teachers in Egypt that were well versed in the Hermetic tradition or ideas? No, that's too early. So Pythagoras is much earlier. So the Hermetic writings. Well, that's are why really I expanded yeah, it. Yeah. So no, that I, is. I think the direction the person is going in is, yeah. is: can there be a real link there? Well, there's one interesting thing. So, so Pythagoras is much earlier than the Hermetic writings. So the, the Hermetic writings are second, third century. Yeah. And the question is: could the Hermetic writings come from an older tradition that's much older than that? And I, uh, I am cautiously tending towards uh, the view that, among other people, Peter Kingsley has been promoting, mm -hmm. uh, saying that there is a uh, Pythagorean tradition which ultimately goes back to Parmenides. So you can trace a line from Parmenides, and that's really early, and mm -hmm. Pythagorean the traditions that gets connected to, uh, to the Hermetica. There are many questions to be asked about it. It is, very, it is speculative to a certain point. It's very hard to prove. But I think there are reasons to take that hypothesis seriously. So that doesn't mean that our Hermetica is influential on, on Pythagoreanism, mm -hmm. but it could mean that Pythagoreanism and also Parmenides mm -hmm. is one of the background uh, ontologies of metaphysical systems that go into our Hermetica. Okay. Yeah, and I tend to see I tend to see them mostly the inter the intellectual machinery coming from Middle Platonism, like Numenius is I think the, the most direct person the new, the new, that the Pythagorean. If you've never read Numenius really read Numenius next to uh, the Corpus Medicum. I think that's the main intellectual power that things are coming from. But also what's really exciting is there's a new edition out of uh, the Conversation of the House of Life that's a demotic text that is attributed to Toth and was used as an initiation, probably as an initiation text, written in Egyptian, used in these temples. And so we are getting a, at least a glimpse now into what was previously basically a black box of what are these Egyptian priests, people like Zosimus, what are they doing in these temples? I mean, from, a, from a liturgical and philosophical point of view in the Egyptian language, the text is very difficult, but I do think that that's an avenue of research that I'm super excited about. Uh, hi, I have a question about, I'm here. <laughs> hi. Uh, I, I have a question about the technical hermetica because uh, we've been mostly talking about the, um, the philosophical or spiritual hermetica, but, um, I don't know that much about the technical Hermetica, other than that they are also attributed to Hermes Trismegistus. But I think some of those are actually a little bit older than uh, the philosophical Hermetica, if I'm right. Uh, but they always feel like quite separate things to me. And also, yeah, tonight is an example because we've been mostly talking about the philosophical Hermetica. Like, how closely were they connected? And did the technical Hermetica play a part in the quest for Gnosis? Uh, for practitioners, uh, for example, in classical times or in the Renaissance? Like, did it travel a bit of a similar path, uh, such as the Philosophical Hermetica? I mean, I, I guess what I would say is I would, I, I think I would agree with Walter, and I would say I just want to challenge the distinction between philosophical, spiritual, technical Hermetica, and say that, that the technical Hermetica, take like the Carinides, something like that, or some of these alchemical and astrological texts, Part of what's motivating them to be attributed to Hermes Trismegistus is the idea of the goodness of the world. And by studying the goodness of the world through alchemy or astrology, one enlivens one's noose to, to behold the glory, the beauty, and the, through Eusebia, reverence, of the world. And therefore, I would say that the distinction between the, the uh, soteriological hermetica or the philosophical hermetica and the technical hermetica are actually just a continuum. One actually makes the other possible. Because at some level, if the world is just bad, if you're, I don't know, if you're a radical dualist, why well, study this thing? It's just a giant clock driven a bunch of by evil damn archons. Like, <laughs> like uh, why would I, it's like to get out. But if it's like, no, it's, this is part of the beauty of the world and I experience that through reverence, and that's part of the road to salvation, then this, 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 this distinction just breaks down. And I think that, that that breakdown is is a very important thing we need to be begin doing is separating, take, showing these as, as 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 a hand in a glove, and not technical versus one actually makes the other possible. Yeah, there's some there's some continuity. I would yeah. say it's a spectrum, and uh, there is some middle ground where where you it's harder to say whether it's technical yeah. or uh, spiritual. It's both. And Zosimos is a good example. So the the practitioner the practitioner of uh, alchemy. 
uh, whom I interpret as an, uh, as an hermetic practitioner next to Jambrichus. And so he was working in laboratories all the time. Uh, that was his work. And I find it hard to, uh, to believe. And it's, uh, that I think is also so consistent with what we know of sociomus. It's hard to believe that somebody who is insistently working with matter all the time would have a totally anti-matter perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he has often been seen as a gnostic, against matter, uh, stereotypical gnostic against matter, but that doesn't make sense. I think you have to see him also as a spiritual practitioner for whom you're trying to uh, discover the secrets, the mysteries of matter, uh, which, and the fact that from a dualistic point of view, the whole breakdown between, ma the, the whole distinction between matter and spirit breaks down. And uh, you're just working with one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, you've both hit on things that um, you know need to be worked on and can definitely uh, be delved into further. And so I wanted to ask you both what you would like to explore in the future and what do you think are the kind of the big questions that still need to be, to be investigated? Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, who goes first? <laughs> <laughs> I guess what I would say what excites me is one, the discovery and publication of Egyptian literature and looking at how Egyptian literature is tying into this literature. And two, more work needs to be done on the technical hermetica because I think that getting, there's so much of that in Arabic and so much of that uh, in, in Syriac that we, we tell a story of, of uh, Egypt, Greece, Thomas Aquinas, uh, and I'm like, hold on, <laughs> what? Uh, what about the you know, the brethren of purity, and what about? You know? And so there's a, a story about the transmission of all that that you know went into Baghdad and uh, the Bayo Hikma, and without telling that story, uh, we have two legs of a stool, and I think that's uh, I don't want to sit on that stool. So, the, so, so these big gaps in transmission, yeah, yeah. And, and and also trans gaps in innovation. What do the brethren of purity do? What are they? What is going on in the Nabataean agri agriculture? How are they transforming Hermes from being what it is in this text to now being the prophet Enoch? And how is this? Yeah. How is this spirituality and the spiritual technology adapting to new environments, especially in uh, in the Near East? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say something similar to what you you just said. I think uh, one of the major challenges is to change our narratives, and not just uh, the narratives about Hermetica, but in order to interpret them in a better new way. We have to uh, get rid of a whole range of uh, old-fashioned Eurocentric uh, narratives of progress that uh, say that uh, basically everything you know, philosophical and good comes from Greece, etc., and uh, marginalizes everything that comes from Egypt, etc., and is superstitious and magical, etc. These are very deeply ingrained narratives in the standard ways of, uh, of uh, thinking of academics. Uh, in my work on the Hermetica, I've been fighting constantly with, with the power of those narratives. So scholars have kept projecting a narratives of Greek superiority on the Hermetica, and you completely get it wrong when you do that. Uh, they have been, been projecting uh, Christian and biblical narratives on the Hermetica. The Hermetica are pagan. There is not a trace of Christianity in it, and uh, very, very little Judaism, a little bit, but very, very little. Uh, they're basically pagan. And, uh, but nevertheless, scholars have, have projected the entire Genesis narrative of the fall of man into matter on the Hermetica, he thought it was there and it wasn't there. And the, for, generation, for generations, people have kept repeating that narrative. So we have, we have to get rid of a lot of these narratives. And another one, and it links to what you said, so you mentioned the brethren of, uh, the brethren of purity and, all, and many of these things in the Islamic world. We have to um, look at Western culture uh, in a much more inclusive way, which, which includes the whole transmission of pagan, uh, pagan traditions uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So we have to get rid of this idea that uh, Judaism and Christianity belongs to the West and Islam doesn't belong there. If you want to act, actually understand how these things work, you have to see this in a much broader context and include a whole largely unexplored field of the transmission of esoteric and uh, hermetic literature in the Islamic world as well. So you need to have the languages, you need to have uh, have you need to look at, uh, at, uh, at Arabic and Persian and Syriac and all these languages, and there's tons of work to be done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, really basic stuff, too. I know a lot of visitors are, are, are surprised to hear that um, knowledge from 
from Egypt had anything to do with the Renaissance. <laughs> well, okay. God forbid. Yeah. <laughs> I have some things to tell them then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, everyone, please join me in thanking these two. <laughs>